Dr. Dagan previously served as chief scientist at the U.S. Agency for International Development, where he created and launched the agency's DARPA for development, the Global Development Lab, and the Grand Challenges for Development program. He also held multiple positions in the Office of Secretary of State across Republican and Democratic administrations, as well as the Coalition Provisional Authority in Iraq, and worked in the Russian Federation to rewrite environmental laws after the fall of the Soviet Union. Dr. Dagan was the founding country director of the Wildlife Conservation, Conservation Society Afghanistan program and helped create Afghanistan's first national park. He's the author of the book, The Snow Leopard Project, which describes that effort and which was selected by the journal Nature as one of the top science books in 2019. In spring 2021, the Snow Leopard Project received the Nautilus Book Awards Gold Award for Heroic Journeys. He holds a PhD in evolutionary biology from the University of Chicago, and among many other awards in 2020, was given the University of Chicago's Medical and Biological Alumni Association's highest honor. Finally, Alex tends to run towards wicked problems and places in the midst of seismic changes. Would you please join me in welcoming Dr. Alex Dagan. Boy, it's really great to do something in person, right? Uh, it's so nice to be here. This is my second time coming to Ohio University and uh, just the incredible welcome I get every single time is pretty extraordinary. Um, I, it's, it's an honor to be able to speak about this issue, particularly just given the seismic changes that we have seen in Afghanistan and that we have seen in the world. And um, I want to start off with kind of what we were trying to do in Afghanistan, but then get into this larger framing. First is kind of where I came out. Um, I was a tropical biologist. I was an extinction scientist. I've been interested in extinction since I was six or eight years old when I found out that we had something called uh, the passenger pigeon that we took from darkening the sky for three days to zero. And I really became fascinated by understanding why do certain species exist and survive environmental change and why do others disappear. And I started, I spent three years in Madagascar, living in a tent, studying these questions, uh, studying spectacular species um, like lemurs, uh, particularly 12 different species of lemurs, and uh, was all set up to actually go teach at the Yale School of For Forestry, was looking at houses, picked my favorite pizza place, Sally's or Pepe's, I was a Sally's person, uh, and 9-11 uh, happened. And I realized at that point that I could not go into academia in a traditional academic career that I wanted to be able to make a difference. If we were going into a place like Iraq, uh, I wanted to go and help. Uh, and so I joined the State Department um, three months into joining, volunteered to go to Iraq, uh, was sent there with this job uh, in the green zone of redirecting former weapon scientists. Uh, and it was not the search for weapons, it was actually harnessing the knowledge of those weapon scientists, nuclear, biological, chemical scientists, and their delivery systems, and having them work to rebuild the country and rebuild civilian science. I was a lemur biologist. I didn't understand, you know, I wasn't a nuclear expert, I wasn't a chemical expert, but I did understand redirecting people from one place to another meant you had to have a vessel to be able to do that. And this is a picture from Saddam's uh, throne room. It's literally missiles going to the west. 
and the, the Baghdad Convention Center, it's Iraqi troops using the power of the atom uh, against the United States that we were there. I also started working on helping bring back something called the Iraqi wetlands in the south of the country, these really important wetlands that Saddam had actually weaponized to use against the people in the south because they were Shia, he was Sunni, uh, he felt that they were going to be aligned against him, aligned with Iran. Uh, and so he, this was a case of using um, something like the environment to actually harm other individuals. When I was talking about this at Columbia University, this guy, Peter Zoller, who's now director of conservation at the Woodland Park Zoo in Seattle, came up and he said, hey, um, great talk on Iraq and on science in Iraq, this is uh, at the Society of Conservation Biology meetings, um, would you like to set up the first national park in Afghanistan? And my wife, my girlfriend at the time, had just moved in with me the week before. Uh, I went to her and said, would you like to go to Afghanistan herself? And she said yes, which is why she's the mother of my children. And off we went. Um, when I got there, it wasn't exactly what I was expecting. The plane landed and people were demining next to the runway, right? There were still bombed out planes at the airport. Much of the city was still recovering from the effects of three decades of war at this point from the Soviet invasion from uh, the Afghan Civil War and then the US invasion of Iraq. And it was really actually very depressing uh, to go to Afghanistan and just see this incredible devastation that been imposed on the environment and the people. And in fact, um, there was so much littered military weaponry. Uh, there were so many bullets and casings and parts you could almost say it was a new geological era in the dirt, a, sur a horizon layer that I was calling the Bellow scene, that this was a place where literally war was now part of the geology. And it was sort of hard to imagine doing conservation, I think, for anyone in a place like Afghanistan. Uh, but then I started seeing sort of this really, I started seeing this incredible inventiveness and creativity and resilience of the Afghan people. And one of the things that I came across was the Afghan Golf Club, uh, which had been heavily mined, and they had cleared it of mines. They used sheep to go back and forth on the greens. They didn't really have grass, so they actually used oil to create the greens, so they're more like browns uh, in Afghanistan. And I said, okay, these are really interesting people, and this is, you know, they're willing uh, to be able to do some incredible things. But as I started looking at the biological diversity in Afghanistan, I realized that actually there was an amazing amount of biodiversity there. And in fact, uh, in these places in Afghanistan, and these are the places I'm gonna talk about in the book, um, Afghanistan in fact was a, you know, people know Afghanistan as being the crossroads of empires. It was a biological Silk Road. It was a cultural Silk Road that connected the West and the East. So many different empires have crossed over Afghanistan, have, have traveled through Afghanistan, but the same thing was true of its biology. And uh, WCS was interested in particularly these particular regions, the Wakhan Corridor, which was, um, which was essentially the dividing line between the British Empire in India and the Russian Empire north of it. Nuristan, this period, this place uh, on the tribal frontiers with Pakistan, uh, this place in the middle, the Hazarajat Plateau, the Hazara, are the remnants of Genghis Khan's armies. And it's this vast plateau that punches into the middle of Afghanistan and where our first national park would be. And this pistachio savanna land uh, and where we were proposing something called the Northwest Afghanistan Game Reserve. And these are the areas that we were looking for uh, and if you look at a map of Afghanistan, what you see is this incredible mix of topography and, and geology and biology. 
So you have deep oak and cedar forests in the east. You have the western end of the Himalayas uh, in Wuhan, that piece that sticks out toward and touches China. You have this area that looks like the American Southwest in the center of countries. You have deep red deserts in the south, and you have this African-like savanna of pistachio trees uh, in the north. And as I said, Afghanistan was one of the routes on the Silk Road, uh, and you saw huge influences of the entire planet there. But you also see the spectacular array of species from Europe, from Eurasia, from Africa and Indo-Malaysia in a single country. People don't realize this, but Afghanistan had more cat species than sub-Saharan Africa. There were tigers in Afghanistan until the 1960s. There were lions in Afghanistan in the 1930s. There are still probably cheetah species in Afghanistan, palace cats, uh, caracals, uh, wild cats, uh, sand cats, a whole wide array of species, hyenas, macaques, uh, brown bears, black, Asiatic black bears within a single species, within a single country. And it is a spectacular place for conservation. So, you know, the original name of the book uh, I proposed, my, my editor didn't like it, uh, was called The Snow Leopard Startup, because she thought everyone would think it was about a Mac operating system. And um, I pointed out that, well, no, it, it isn't, because what we were doing was, was building a startup. And when I got to Madagascar, to Afghanistan, we had no permission to work in the country. I had $10,000 in cash. I had no budget, no people, no cars. We were six months behind schedule for USAID, and I had uh, no staff. Uh, and I had to get people into some of the most remote places in the world within 30 days and figure out how to do that. So it's a lot like a startup, I thought, as I told my editor. Uh, within what we were doing. So I started working at a place that was essentially a glorified motel with very neurotic Westerners, uh, some of which would just pace back and forth in their rooms in their underwear for sometimes for some reason. And we had picnic tables uh, that were in the middle of these courtyards of this motel. And we just took over the picnic tables. We took over the computer science room. There was an NGO that was uh, closing down, we hired their entire staff uh, on the part, and we started just work. We bought laptops for everybody and just started working to be able to get things into place. And there were all kinds of sort of traps that all startups actually run into that I didn't even realize. I bought a map for my office to figure out where things were and what we were trying to do and how we we're going to try to get to some of these places to do the first you know, surveys of wildlife in 30 years after three decades of war. Was there anything left was the question we needed to know. There was some indication that there was, but how much? We estimated there, this is the western end of the distribution of snow leopards that range from Afghanistan to Bhutan. We knew that there was perhaps 100 snow leopards in Afghanistan. Were there Persian leopards in Afghanistan? What had happened to the Asiatic cheetah in terms of what we were talking about? What had happened to the Asiatic black bear? What had happened to the macaques and the hyenas and the different species that are in these areas? And so I bought a map. And one of the things we were trying to do was build a four country peace park, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Tajikistan, and China. And when I, when I had a visitor come and visit me, and I said, yeah, we're trying to build a peace park in the northeast of the country that brings those four countries together because the wildlife don't understand political boundaries. Uh, so let's manage them as a single ecosystem. The person turned to me and said, what about India? And I sort of looked at him and I said, well, India doesn't border Afghanistan. And he pointed to my map that, was, that I had bought and put on my wall. And lo and behold, on my map that I had bought and put on my wall, India had bordered Afghanistan. And that's because the Afghans really don't like the Pakistanis. And because they didn't like them, they gave half of Pakistan to Afghanistan, and they gave all of Kashmir to India. 
uh, that's not what the actual border looks like. There's, India doesn't touch Afghanistan at this point. So I had already gotten into, I had to spend the rest of the meeting arguing with someone that, in, that my map that I had bought was wrong. We had also had to figure out how to get cars. When in, you are in Afghanistan, all the cars that you get are white. And we specifically didn't want white cars because the UN used white cars and white cars got shot at. And so we, uh, I chose to paint all my cars Duke blue, uh, which I thought as a Duke alumni I needed to do as the appropriate thing. And we would look much more like the opioid dealers that, 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 that never got shot at. So we said, all right, that was the first thing. The second thing was you had to think about how heavy your car was. If your car was too heavy, we had to go across streams and across roads, and we had to think about those things. Uh, um, and you would sink, and you wouldn't come back out of the streams that you had to cross. Um, so when you put in armoring into a car, your car would sink. If you didn't have enough armoring, then people could shoot at you with a AK-47, a 7.62 bullet that would go right through your car door and into you. If you also drove over an anti-personnel mine, it, you know, that also kind of ends your day. Uh, so we had to figure out what was the right level of armoring. We chose, okay, we'll get shot at, but we will have a, something called a ballistic blanket underneath our car so we could drive over the mines. That was the compromise. So the car wasn't too heavy, so it wouldn't sink. Um, and we had to deal with risk. And the one thing I didn't want to do, I was sending people where they would be traveling by yak and horse for six weeks at a time with no access to the roads. I had to teach them how to self-rescue and self-save them. I also had to figure out how was I able to make decisions as to these individuals, external experts, international experts in conservation, in, in wildlife. Uh, my Afghan staff, of which I had, we quickly hired up to 70 individuals. What risks were we willing to take? And the key, you know, the best advice I got on, on entrepreneurship was the best entrepreneurs don't seek risk, they seek to mitigate risk. The risks we had to take was uh, improvised explosive devices, particularly what are called vehicle-borne improvised explosive devices. We would get warnings from an organization that helped NGOs look out for security, and every single of the warnings would say, the risk that you, the improvised explosive device is a white Toyota Corolla mid-1990s or a white Toyota Camry, mid-1990s. 95% of the cars in Afghanistan are mid-1990s Toyota Corollas. They have, they love those cars. Uh, and so we decided to do the best thing. We decided to join everyone, and we started driving around in a mid-1990s Toyota Corolla because the best way to actually fit in was to be able to merge. And we rented it from our own staff. Uh, that's my wife sitting in it to be able to do it. We also had to think about how to just deal with the fact that the entire country was flooded with guns. Uh, these are the conservationists uh, that were working for us. And it was a real risk because that was a threat to us and it was a threat. We did not carry any guns with us. We had no weapons. We had no weapons on our facility. That was a rule. We didn't want to ever be in a situation where we needed to use weapons within what we were trying to do. But the thing that scared me the most was the fact that Afghanistan at the time I was there was the third most heavily landmined country in the world. And we had a number of, and this is the real statistic, is to buy one costs three to $10, to remove one costs 300 to $1,000. Uh, and we worked with organizations, you know, we were lucky enough, to, there were organizations there, uh, including some associated with Princess Diana, that were removing mines in Afghanistan. But just to give you one example, the Bounding Fragmentation Mine is a mine that you hit a tripwire, and then that middle part, it's the part that is spiky, bounces up to chest height and then fragments. And the reason this mine was developed was if you just take out someone's leg, they can still return to the field of combat. 
What was really insidious was the Russians started using something called the butterfly mine. So it had wings and they would just throw it out of helicopters. And one of the rules of war is that you actually maintain mine maps. People stopped maintaining mine maps. People started mining the edges of rivers where people needed to go to get water. They started mining all kinds of places. Um, that, that butterfly mine has these flexible wings on them. And if you bend those, those wings, it explodes. It looks like a toy. So a lot of children actually got taken out by that. They're now using those mines in Ukraine. So it was especially devastating. But the risk to us was we would inadvertently, in search of wildlife, which happened to us a number of times, end up in a mined area. And you knew you were, sometimes you were lucky enough to know you're in a mined area because the red reflects where the mined area is and the white reflects where the cleared area is. In this landscape, that white path is the only safe path through that landscape. Everything else is mined. Um, that is pretty extraordinary. So the first place we worked is this area that was referred to as the roof of the world. This is the Wakong Corridor. And it's made up of these three areas, uh, the Big Pamir, the Little Pamir, and the Wajir Valley. And you can see a close-up of it down there. It is made up of this huge corridor and U-shaped valleys. It is a place of cascading uh, glaciers. It is a place so steep. The, the, the floor of that valley is at 9,000 feet. The mountains hit 17,000 feet and higher. It is, it is in the middle of the north-south bird migration. And it is such a barrier that the north-south bird migration actually turns east-west to be able to move through this corridor. Afghanistan and the Wakhan uh, sit at this crossroads of multiple mountain ranges, the Pamir Mountains, the Karakum Mountains, the Hindu Kish, the Tian Shan, and the Kunluns, and they make this massive aggregation of topography called the Pamir Knot. And to get there, this is the national highway, uh, and then it just sort of disappears as you're within the corridor. You're not really sure of, and, uh, of where the road is, uh, and then you will have crossings of rivers where, you know, it is, it is very disconcerting to have icebergs in your rear view, side view mirrors, particularly when it says these things are closer than they may uh, seem um, when you're crossing. And it is even more disconcerting is when you have to do those crossings in the middle of the night and you can't exactly see where the path is uh, within what you're doing. But at a certain point, halfway through the Wakhan, you run out of road. You're close to something called the Eurasian Pole of Inaccessibility, it is this massive wilderness landscape. And you are traveling uh, from village to village and having to negotiate at every village for pack horses, mules, for yaks, uh, and traveling um, over these roads that were actually part of the historical Silk Road. These are roads that Marco Polo himself took in the 13th century. And it's spectacular landscape. Uh, and it brings you to places like this. Um, and what is sad for me, even on my book, if you look at the cover of the book, it's the picture of Afghanistan you always see in the media is one of this dusty, desiccated, lifeless place. And nothing could be farther from the truth in these places. Um, these are, the Pamirs are literally referring, is the name for these uh, U-shaped valleys. This is one of the most beautiful places uh, on the planet. It's the western end of the Himalayas, glacier lakes. And there are these people who live there. There's the Wahi people who are followers of the Aga Khan. They're Ismaili. Uh, and then you have the Kyrgyz people, which are Turkish-speaking nomads. Uh, that um, whose entire wealth is, is in their livestock. And that becomes really important because the way that we could bring them on board was getting them to realize that over grazing of the rangelands not only affected the species that we cared about, but it hurt their chances of survival. In this part of Afghanistan, uh, right, right when the US first went in, 60% of women 
died in childbirth. This is the highest rates of, of mortality during childbirth in the world at that time. It is a very harsh place to survive. And the way that we were able to actually make the case for conservation was to make the case for people's survival within what we're doing. We were there in part to see what happened to these species called Marco Polo sheep. And they're called Marco Polo sheep because Marco Polo literally wrote about him in his book, Travels, the, the, the great epic tome that Marco Polo wrote of his journeys where he traveled through these areas. They're the biggest mountain sheep in the world. They're horn, I like to call them Princess Leia sheep, right? They've got the, the curves on the end, but their horns are six feet long if you follow the length of the horns. They're enormous. And they live in these sex segregated groups for most of the year until the mating season, and then the males come together butting heads uh, uh, for the right to actually reproduce um, in what you're doing. The other thing we were trying to figure out, as I mentioned, was what is the status of the snow leopards um, in these regions? And the one thing that we started doing as we started working in these areas, as we started working with local communities, uh, was, was there was actually many more snow leopards than we had thought. There were, in fact, hundreds of snow leopards, 300 to 400 uh, individuals within these populations. We then started actually trying to promote ecotourism. There are multiple mountains there that have never been scaled. Uh, there's ways to access this region from Tajikistan, uh, which is easier to do. Uh, this, we started working with other organizations who are training the first female uh, mountain guides who are training Sherpas. We were setting up guest reg uh, residences. But one of the most important things for us to do was to stop retaliatory killing of snow leopards. And the reason people were killing snow leopards was they were overgrazing the land. And when you were overgrazing the land, there isn't enough food for the prey that the snow leopards actually eat. And there's not enough food for the ungulates that people actually are trying to raise. So by working with them to reduce predation events, to um, improve the management of the rage lens, we reduced the pressures on the snow leopards that were there. The second area that we started working on is this place called Nuristan. And Nuristan is in what's called the Eastern Forest Complex. It is an area of oak and cedar forests. Um, again, not an image you have of Afghanistan, of a place that looks a lot like Colorado or Montana or Idaho uh, in the United States. These mountains are incredibly steep. Uh, countless empires have tried to invade this particular part of the world and have failed because of the steepness of the terrain. And in fact, there's so many different sort of nuanced cultures in each of these valleys. Um, they are um, pretty extraordinary. Uh, what's there is things like Persian leopards, uh, this really incredibly beautiful species called palaces cats. Uh, um, Asiatic black bear, hyenas, wolves, um, and marbled polecats, uh, macaques, flying squirrels live in this area, and this species. This one is, you know, in my opinion, sort of a twin horned unicorn. If, you, if you've ever seen the documentary Planet Earth where a snow leopard is chasing an ungulate down straight a, a cliff face, and it's able to do that because the snow leopard's tail, the Persian leopard's tail is a third of the body length. The snow leopard's tail is the length of the body, right? So it literally acts as a balance that allows it to run down those cliffs, and then it's got huge paws, right? It was chasing this animal, the marhor, which for some reason its name translates to snake eater. I've never seen it eat snakes. Uh, but one of the challenges that it has, and it lives on these, again, impossibly steep cliffs, one of the challenges is that people spend $100,000 to be able to kill uh, these particular species. Um, right next door across the borders in Pakistan. But the area is filled with uh, the culture. The Nuristan means land of the enlightened. They also used to be called Kafiristan, which means land of the unbelievers. And in fact, when Alexander the Great tried to invade the area, he fell in love with the people. He believed they were followers of Dionysus because they drank wine, had like crazy parties, like super loud singing, <laughs> uh, body songs. 
uh, and wrote about these people. They were also, um, they, they tend to have green eyes. They're very striking individuals, but their culture is also really interesting. They're really well known for their carvings. Their carpets even look different. Their carpets are a mix of what's called a clean, which is a flat rug, and a farsh, which is like a deep pile rug. So we have 3D topography in the carpet that almost mirrors the landscape that you actually see. Um, but this place was also, uh, you know, this and Kunar next door um, uh, is, is part of, you know, what was called the Valley of Death. This was a very unsafe place for Americans to be. This was a place where a lot of foreign fighters came in through Pakistan uh, into the region. The Nuristanis actually live on the mountainsides at the top. And they were known historically for, for hundreds of years to be raiders. They would raid the caravans coming through the valleys uh, and then recruit themselves and secure themselves to these, to these houses. They're literally built one on top of the other. Uh, so we thought that's a good place for us to put our office uh, with the Wildlife Conservation Society was up with the people who are doing the raiding, uh, which was probably the and that that in the steepest parts of the places where uh, people were going. The problems in in you know when you're in a war zone, one of the things that happens is the rule of law and governance fails. And in this case, Pakistan actually had good environmental laws. So people would come across the border and deforest these forests in Nuristan. So we started using satellite analysis to understand deforestation. We started going into wood markets to figure out where the forest and where the lumber was going to understand who was doing this work and how that work was trying to go. We started working with mullahs in the region because this was, again, a really dangerous region to work in. Uh, to actually highlight that the Quran had provisions for conservation within it and working with them to get them on our side. Um, and we started doing wildlife surveys. Uh, this area is really steep, really snowy, really hard to get into. Uh, but we started looking for assessing what was the state. We started doing camera trapping. Every once in a while, the United States would bomb our camera traps, which would buy us our data. Uh, we uh, would do mammal surveys. We were, uh, we, were, we were doing transects through this area to figure out what the carnivores were. We were collecting scats. Uh, and we found that there was still Persian, Persian leopard and wolf populations and, and hyena populations in these areas. Uh, the other thing that we actually found as we were working in these spaces uh, was there had been reports that this animal known as the musk deer may still exist. It hadn't been seen in 50 years in this area. If the word musk sounds familiar, is because this is literally where part of perfume comes from. If you've heard the term musk, it came from a gland that's on the belly of this deer, which naturally released these waxy secretions that people would trade throughout the Middle East to use for perfumes. Kings and queens would, would look for these materials. I like to call this Bambi with fangs, but um, it is kind of cute. It is kind of worrisome when you see them. Uh, but it lived in areas that were so steep that even the people living there were not sure that it still existed. And WCS team started collecting hair uh, to actually then verify that, that it was there. And then we finally saw the individuals, plus using the hair and genetic samples to verify their existence in this area. The third area we were going was this place, the Northwest Afghanistan Game Reserve. Um, and the reason we went out there, this is a place called Herat. It's near the Iranian border. Turkmenistan is in the north. Um, is we went out to lunch with, our, uh, with some of our staff. And they, um, on the walls of the restaurant, this local place we went to was a cheetah skin. And Everything we had heard, the evidence that we had seen were the cheetahs had, you know, the cheetah population in Iran. This is a different subspecies of cheetah than exists in Africa. This is what's called the Asiatic cheetah. The cheetah population in Iran is probably down to 30 individuals. They have the largest home ranges of any cheetah because their prey base is so distributed, they have to range for miles. And because of that, their ability to find another mate is 
reduced. And literally, if you, you know, if your Tinder date lives 200 miles away, the chances of a hookup are less, right? Uh, but at the same time, they also, a huge mark, when you get below 50 individuals, when you get below 500 individuals, you're in, the, you're in the extinction vortex. When you get below 50 individuals, you're on that track to extinction where single chance events like car accidents with cheetahs are enough to actually send that population to extinction. And we asked the owner where this, he had gotten this, and they said this came out of Herat province, and this had been hunted recently. So we wanted to go look for this particular species in this place, these pistachio woodlands. Now, most of the pistachio have been cut, um, <coughs> and uh, it's been heavily deforested. There's something else called the Asiatic wild ass that lives there. There's a number of really cool species, uh, but it was also a difficult species because the border with Iran, uh, essentially opium drug dealers are are heavily, heavily armed. And the border of Iran is also one of the most highly mined areas in Afghanistan. So we, we had serious concerns about running into mines uh, in these areas, and we had serious concerns about running into these drug dealers. Uh, but we were looking for this really cool species, the, the Asiatic species. So this guy, George Schaller, some of you may know, he did some of the first work on the gorillas, on the African lion, on the Marco Polo sheep, uh, who was part of the Wildlife Conservation Society, who I was working with, uh, came out and we went on expedition to go look for the Asiatic cheetah. And we came to villages that had described the cheetah, that had seen the cheetah, that had said that it's there. And then independently, there was evidence that there were other skins that people were finding. Uh, uh, there was a researcher, I think, from Denmark that had found some in, in Mazar Sharif. But we can never, the, the military, Afghan military and the Afghan police that were with us were afraid to go to the region that everyone was saying where the cheetahs were because they were outgunned by the drug dealers. So we never were able to get there. The, the last place we would work is this place in the middle of the country. This is the Hazarajat Plateau. This is that the blue in there is essentially it looks like the American Southwest. It looks like the Grand Canyon. These are um, 9,000, 10,000, 12, 13,000 foot plateaus that, that punch into the middle of Afghanistan. And at one point, this was part of the Teva Sea. This was, um, you know, ocean bottom. And then when India essentially hits the Asian plate, this was part of the uplift uh, associated with the Himalayas. People remember this because of the Buddhas. And there were these, um, in two incredible Buddhas that this was one of the, the Bamiyan was a monastery town, a Buddhist monastery town. It was a pathway uh, for um, the Silk Road, the, these two Buddhas. You can see actually, uh -oh. you can see, um, see if I can get it back. I hope I can get it back. Oh, well. We need to plug in the computer. I think that would actually help with, uh, with the power. So give me a second. Why is everything working? But people may remember there's these two giant Buddhas that sat in those alcoves. And the, um, the communities that were there, uh, the Taliban blew them up. And those Buddhas, there, uh, if you could see from the uh, from that that picture, are um, maybe over a each of those small squares is probably 10, 12 feet. So we were looking at almost 200 feet at that point. 
Uh, they had been there for 800 years overlooking this area. So this was seen as sort of a crime against humanity by the Taliban. The pieces of those Buddhas are still down below. There's an argument as to whether you rebuild these things. Um, it was never settled. This was a, um, a UNESCO World Heritage Site as well. But nearby was this incredible landscape of these six what are called travertine lakes. These are lakes created by super saturated calcium carbonate in the water. It's the same process that forms stalactites and slagmites. And they created essentially dams around these lakes um, that uh, are really incredible. You also had, uh, you can't see it, but in that small hill in the forefront, there are two partially carved uh, Buddhas that were never finished. And then the second most holy Shia shrine in the country is literally at the edge of the lake. And then the top of those hills, which are around 9, 10, 12,000 feet, are filled with a bevy of marine fossils uh, in this area. So th this was the closest place in 1979 to being declared Afghanistan's first national park. And then the Russians invaded, and it was put on hold. And we decided that there was a good reason uh, you can see the dams from this region, that, that we wanted to actually make this Afghanistan's first national park because it was important to the Afghan people and to their identity to be able to allow their life to continue, to allow the interruption that they felt with three decades of war to be able to continue. Um, you can see that, that literally those, that, that edge or that dam is about 60 feet high uh, and the lakes are deeper than that. Um, there's another area that was a former hunting reserve of the King Nome as the Adra Valley. Uh, you can see some of the marine fossils uh, in the rocks. And here the WCS teams actually started looking for, uh, looking for Persian leopards in particular. We started doing camera trapping of the Persian leopards as well as ibex. And most of the time when you have a view of ibex, this is the view. They're looking down at you in terms of what you saw. So we would see ibex on our camera trap, but we also would see hunters on the next slide following after them. So we started working. We started, this is Chris Shank, uh, who's, 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 who was working in Afghanistan in 1979 for the FAO, and we brought him back working on this area uh, to actually essentially talk to the communities of what, you know, of this idea of creating this national park uh, and then building essentially community conservation committees that would be, instead of us as Westerners in charge of this effort, the Afghans would be in charge of this effort. One of the things we did was actually have elections of all the small towns in the watershed around those six travertine lakes that were there. This was actually, um, one of the things we did was build a, um, a center for that park that was intended to match the environment rather than distract from it. The people who came in that were elected by their villages would walk in for three to four hours just to be able to participate within these meetings um, around what they were doing. And then we actually had the first meeting of the conservation committee that brought together the national level government. Uh, next to the woman that's standing is the deputy minister of of agriculture, and next to that, the bearded man is from the National Environmental Protection Agency. This is uh, Governor Sarabi, who was the first female governor of Afghanistan, also uh, who, who was governor of the province. And then we had the local level officials who were, who were there. And this group literally uh, voted and set the rules for the governance of this national park. And watching this, was like watching the Constitutional Convention because we weren't leading this process. They were leading this process and we were watching this and, and um, shivers literally went up my spine. Uh, and when I went back to Kabul after doing this and I met someone um, at the Serena Hotel who worked for the National Democratic Institute and I described this process, he turned to me and he said, you're doing our job. And I realized that this idea of democracy is really hard in the abstract for people to understand. 
But if there's a tangible basis for people to make governance decisions relating to something they care about, and 80% of the population in Afghanistan depended on natural resources. So their survival depended on those natural resources just as the Marco Polo sheep, just as the snow leopard. You could make democracy real for people. And this was one of the most exciting moments for me. It led to the creation of the first national park in Afghanistan and then led to the next five national parks uh, in Afghanistan. One other thing that happened was we started seeing uh, skins and materials for sale in the stores. We also heard about US soldiers putting in orders for snow leopard comforters, and someone put in an order for 100 comforters made out of lynx that if it was actually filled, would eliminate the entire population of lynx in the entire country. And so we said, um, let's actually, there's a tiger skin, there's a Persian leopard skin, there's a wolf skin. Um, how can we shut down this trade? And what was kind of extraordinary was this trade was happening on, at the US embassy, at other embassies, on Bagram Air Base, at NATO bases, and at NATO headquarters. And we realized that we needed to shut this down. And that the humanitarians that had come to Afghanistan to protect and help rebuild the country were inadvertently driving this trade. So we needed to change something. It wasn't all Westerners. There were, <laughs> we were driving by and saw this guy carrying a stuffed Persian leopard, I guess, as a decoration for his house. Um, but something else also happened that was really disturbing. I was on a plane and I bought a PlayStation Portable because when you travel to Afghanistan, the likelihood of your plane taking off in time is low. And the likelihood of you being stuck in random airports is very high. Um, and so I'd have a lot of downtime and I would be, I was playing with this thing, the PlayStation Portable, playing a game on, on the plane into Afghanistan. And the flight steward goes, I just bought one too. He was Afghan Cam Airs and Afghan Airlines. And I said, oh, that's nice. And I went back to my game and he's like, did you know you can put pictures and video on it? And I was like, no, that's, that's pretty cool. And then the flight steward handed me his PlayStation Portable and he showed you know, the person who is leading the major environmental effort in Afghanistan, this video. And just give me a second to play it. And I'm first looking, and I'm looking at people who are actually on the plane that I was on. And they're having a good time. They're smoking, which I thought was weird, like who smokes on planes anymore. But they're going, and, um, I'm like, the singing's not great, but, but I'm, I'm, I'm watching it. Uh, cuts through the plane and starts filming these falcons. These are sacred falcons. Um, they're used in falconry. The best falcons are wild caught. They're frequently taken out of places like Afghanistan or Pakistan. They can cost between $10,000 and $100,000 a bird. Uh, and these guys, this is my favorite part, is the person filming is trying to explain what he's doing. He's like, movie, movie. And then he looks at this guy and he just gets out of there. Like, he, like that guy gave him a death look and he was not, he was for good reason, uh, potentially scared. These people were flying, had rented a commercial airline to fly into Kandahar, one of the least stable, most dangerous parts of the country to go on a camping trip or a hunting trip for six weeks. And they were doing so with sacred falcons uh, and they were doing to hunt this pretty incredible bird called the Hubara Bustard, uh, which has uh, kind of one of the most bizarre mating behaviors I've ever seen, which is it puffs up like a giant volleyball hides its head in the, its feathers so it can't see, and then runs around madly, and that's how it impresses its mate. 
Well, they use the seekers. They will kill sometimes hundreds to thousands of these birds during some of these hunting trips. This is a bird that, it, that is endangered in many of these countries. And we realized that wildlife trafficking and wildlife trade was an issue that wasn't on our radar. But because of what was happening from foreigners, because of what was happening in the country, we needed to do so. So we started a publicity campaign. We started writing to all the embassies. We started publishing papers in the expat journals. We started working with Afghan media. But most importantly, we started working with the military police and, what was real, and training them on how to shut down the markets at Bagram, at these embassies. And what was really exciting was watching these young 21-year-old soldiers just with a thirst for knowledge to be able to help us in what we were doing. The State Department stepped in to help us. Uh, so many organizations stepped in, and they were inspecting the markets and shutting down illegal trade. We also started working with the, the airport at Kabul. It's now much nicer than this. Um, and train the people, the customs inspectors at the airport. And in fact, I would miss planes because they would insist on showing me everything they had seized because they were so proud of the jobs that they had done. We had started working with the postal employees to prevent them from being able to, because this was illegal under Afghan law, it was illegal under US law, it was illegal under European law, it was illegal under CITES. And for a long time, if you were flying in and out of Afghanistan, the only posters in the airport, the only decorations were our posters uh, on wildlife. And then I got a call, and I got a call from the fur dealers. And they're like, we want to see you. And I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, I guess so. And if you guys remember, I had no guns. We had no weapons. We had nothing. And I just had this image in my mind that they were, gonna, for some reason, I imagined 1930 Tommy guns, that these guys were going to come in and just like rat a tat a tat a tat and like, bam. And I was like, well, you know, I had a good life. Um, you know, if this is the end, like, I died doing what I wanted to do. So I took the meeting. And the fur dealers came in. They're like, hey, we care about Afghan wildlife, too. So train us about what species we need to avoid using. And the very last thing I did in Afghanistan was actually train those fur dealers on which species to protect. One of the things that was really incredible about this project was the fact that we never suffered from corruption that most Afghan projects did. We never were asked for bribes. We were supported by parliamentarians, all the members of the government, local people were supportive. We slept in people's houses uh, when we traveled. And I think the reason for this was because for five, you know, 5.4 million Afghan refugees for three decades, and now unfortunately, again, Restoring the wildlife was a way that we could actually restore their identity. That people related to this because their lives depended on the wildlife. Because people actually decorated their house, their houses with pictures of Marco Polo sheep and ibex, uh, you know, using, using skulls. That there were 2,000 year old petroglyphs with pictures of ibex on them on the pathways of the Silk Road. And when we declared not only the first national park, but the next four, um, what was really encouraging to me was we had 170,000 visitors, and they were almost all entirely Afghans to that first national park. And they referred to it as an oasis of peace. And it taught me, and this is where I've always ended my talks, until this year. This is the first talk I've given since the Afghan pullout. That there is hope even in these places that we think are really hard to solve. And then, you know, you think 2020 was bad and then 2021 comes along and uh, actually 2022, you know, we now have other issues. Uh, and we make an announcement that we're withdrawing from Afghanistan. 
Kabul falls, it's expected to take one to two years. It, it literally falls a few months later. Uh, and then as soon as Kabul falls, uh, the United States has fully withdrawn. Uh, we were able to evacuate 120,000 people, but just very quickly, the Taliban came in. One of the reasons for this was many of the people that were part of the Afghan National Army were fictional. Corruption was such a big problem that the army wasn't actually there to defend the country. And this is, you know, the special forces, a lot of those people were there, but a lot of the numbers that we thought were there were not. And, you know, quite frankly, history repeated itself, right? Afghan fighters defeated the British army three times in the 19th century, the Russian military in the 20th century, and potentially, you could say, the US military in the 21st. And during this period, you know, we saw these terrible scenes from Kabul airport, uh, which is literally surrounded by a sewage canal. People in this canal, you know, giving up their children so their children have a chance to get out of the country. You know, people waiting to get on planes. <coughs> U.S. military trying to get as many people as possible in their globe master uh, planes to evacuate to Qatar uh, and other places. And, but this picture, which was on Twitter, uh, killed me. Because this is my national park. This is that first national park. And there is the Taliban, Taliban with rocket-propelled grenades on the toy boats in the national park having a pretty good time. Uh, unfortunately, you know, there, that flooding of guns has happened again, and people are again going after the wildlife. So, you know, the, the one question to me was, what was our obligation to Afghanistan? What is still our obligation to Afghanistan? We were there for 20 years. We accomplished some things. We took down Osama bin Laden. We transformed this country, but we spend a lot of blood and treasure in these places. Colin Powell had a rule called the Pottery Barn Rule that said, you know, look, if you break it, you got to pay for it. You've got to be responsible for it. Uh, but I was left with this incredible, difficult choice, right? I had taken people through the master's degree. But like, when I got to Afghanistan, literacy was at 18%. And I had to take the, the individuals I could get and train them to be conservation society, scientists. And over 20 years, sorry. Over 20 years, Right? We had taken people to get master's degrees and then PhDs in the West. And some of those people had just returned to Afghanistan when the United States pulled out. So do I say, as someone literally wrote to me today, I hope we can continue to do conservation in Afghanistan. So we say, hey, you people who have worked with the West, you people who are Hazara and will be hunted by the Taliban, you people who are female park guards, you people with daughters that cannot go to school, that might be trafficked, that might be married as a teenager, do you stay in the country because you gotta keep doing conservation because that's what we want? Or do we pull them out and you know, 20 years of my work and the work that we've done uh, and probably the best thing I've done in my career uh, and we'd say, sorry. That was the impossible choice I felt in, in, uh, in August. Um, and for the last six months, I've been funding safe houses. I've been working with former military who also, like me, believe you cannot leave people behind because I've put three, even though it was 12 years since I was in Afghanistan, even though there's been many other country directors and, and WCS has made tens of millions of dollars off this program, I didn't believe that I, I felt I had an obligation. I felt that I was subject to the Pottery Barn rule even though I didn't break it. It was still my responsibility. So we started raising money. Uh, we started funding safe houses because people were being hunted, their, their parents being captured, the grandparents being captured by the Taliban and imprisoned so they could come back. We started trying to, working with WCS, to evacuate people to Pakistan, which, which wasn't welcoming to the 
to, to the Afghans, trying to charter planes and helicopters to get people out of the country, to apply for P2 visas, which is much lower than the SIVs. Most of the 120,000 people we evacuated are people who worked with the military or the embassy. But there's this whole generation of people who worked with USAID contractors that we've left behind. You know, we've tried to apply for humanitarian parole. We've spent $17,000 on visa fees the United States charges to allow individuals who are at risk temporarily to come into the United States. They've only approved 500 of them and have collected $23 million in those fees. Uh, and we started working with other governments because these individuals needed to get out. They needed a safe place. The good news is Two weeks ago, the government of Mexico said, we'll take 19 of your people. And they, we were able to get the global conservation community, the Mexican conservationists in Mexico City to actually give apartments for free to the Afghans, nice apartments furnished, to give them an opportunity for a year to be in Mexico where they are not being hunted. This happened literally uh, in the last couple of weeks. Um, we were able to get these out after six months of almost continuous work within what we're doing. Hopefully in the next week, we will get somewhere between another 10 to 20 more individuals out, but there's still right, 250 other individuals, their children, their family, that are at risk. And one of the challenges we have is how many of your family can you take with you, right? If we can take you and your wife and your children, do your grandparents stay behind so we can take another conservationist? What is the right thing? All these choices are impossible, but we, are gratitude, we have gratitude to the government of Mexico for stepping up. We're trying to get the government of Canada to step up. And as we think about Ukraine, right now. We think about what's happening in Ukraine. We think about the unthinkable there, about the idea of a thermobaric weapon, which is, you know, second only to a nuclear weapon. And, and you know, the, I heard an expert say on NPR the other day, the reason Aleppo in Syria, where they use thermobaric, Russians use thermobaric weapons, is peaceful is because everyone died, right? You don't have any problems with dead people is if we're not leading the world, if we're not stepping up, the United States, who will do so? And I think, you know, we doesn't have to just be our government. We can be us. We can be all of us who are here at Ohio University, all of us who are here in the United States, all of us who are part of a global community to be able to do so. The book is a much better storyteller than I am. So if you're interested in the book, uh, you can scan that picture, it'll take you there. A lot of you, thanks to Jeff, have read the book uh, in the class. Um, but the other thing I'm doing is we raise money for the Afghans. And one thing I'm committing to is, to the extent that Ohio University wants to step up, I will match up to $8,700 uh, uh, anything that is donated from tonight onward uh, over the course of the next two weeks. So if you do want to step up, you do want to help, uh, this is a great chance to do so. You can just look up Afghan Environmental Defenders. There's a second GoFundMe that just supports those people who are in Mexico because unfortunately the Mexican government won't let them go to school and won't let them have jobs. So we still have to support them as their visas in the U.S. are processing. With that, Thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions. Anybody? Come on, there's something you're interested in. There's some, some point. I promise I won't be as heavy and depressing as, as maybe the end of the talk was.
I love that. Please. I started that project in 2006. I was there for two years, just, just under two years. Yeah, so, um, no, 12 years since I had been in Afghanistan, or a little more than 12 years from, from when I left, 14 years, almost 14, 15 years that, since, I, since I first got to Afghanistan. So Wildlife Conservation Society, which is the Bronx Zoo, was the organization I was working for at the time. That's, yeah. Yeah, well, all right, so, the, so what happened, um, and it's, in the, it's the actual epilogue of the book, is um, I, had, I had been in the State Department working in the policy planning staff for Secretary Rice. Uh, one of the papers I actually wrote at the time was, uh, it's nice that we're responding to things like NEPA and avian influenza. Let's think about the upstream reasons why pand pandemics happen, including thinking about uh, wildlife trafficking, deforestation, and climate change, and the pet trade, uh, and was told it wasn't an important issue at that time. Uh, and I sent that memo back to the guy in June of 2020 reminding them that I wrote that. But it wasn't a really great, admit, it wasn't a great place for me in terms of science, and I went to Afghanistan. When I came back, I was really, um, you know, there, if you're reading the book, there was a lot of challenges with USAID at the time, the US Agency for International Development. One of the problems was the only metric they were using was burn rates. How fast are you spending money? So when I would talk about how we were saving money so we had more money to train Afghans or more money or that we were hiring Afghans and training them up to be experts, they were like, why don't you just hire a Westerner? And I was like, you, how do you think you don't understand what we're doing here, right, in this country? The effect of which was, you know, m my experience with USAID was really antagonistic. So when I came back to the United States, my thought was, I need to change USAID. So then I joined the administration, the Obama administration, uh, with the intent of restoring science to its rightful place at USAID, transforming how we do international development. And that's what I did. It became actually kind of one of the one of the major reforms around aid. Uh, and it was kind of cool. And one of the reasons it was kind of cool was in the Afghanistan Pakistan Bureau. They had a conference room called the Banda Amir Conference Room. That's the first national park. And they had a picture of my national park. So I'd hold all my meetings in that conference room and I'd just be like, yeah, I created that, uh, particularly when the meetings weren't going well. But the idea was to change USAID. Uh, at USAID, I created a DARPA for development, what was called the Global Development Lab. Um, DARPA is at the DOD, the group that has created the internet, drones, self-driving cars, a lot of these innovations that we see. And we needed something because, you know, the speed and the scale of our interventions were not matching the speed and the scale of the problems we were facing. We needed to rethink how we were doing development. And we were also becoming irrelevant. Even though we were the world's biggest development agency at $20 billion a year, bilateral development agency, there were entire people who were working on development who could care less about our existence. And it wasn't sure that I, the first trip out to Silicon Valley, I wrote a memo to our administrator and I said, I've seen the future and we're not in it. And that was the transformation that we did. And we started using things like grant challenges to open up procurement in the agency, to be able to bring in ideas from people in the developing world, to, to balance out our gender ratios, to find new solvers and new solutions. And at the end of that process, I said, well, we should do this for extinction. And so after I left USAID, I had a sort of bevy of places I could go, uh, various deanships and vice presidencies. And I said, hey, in my mid 40s, I want to start a startup because that's a great idea for your retirement and your family. 
and I created Conservation X Labs, which is intended to be essentially a center for a Bell Labs or a Google X for, for conservation to allow us to have, to use this amazing democratization of technology to empower conservationists to address some of these problems. That's the long, sorry about the long story, but that's kind of the, maybe I should have gone into it, into the beginning. From what I've seen, uh, just literally Facebook comments made by people who were in the government, it, they are no longer in the government, right? The Taliban is now the government. Some of, most of the, the, this is one of the challenges, I think, in Afghanistan, is all these people we invested in want nothing more than to leave right now. And my wife had a great statement, she was like, so the one of the issues we face right now is that the Taliban is closing the door for people to leave because they're so worried about brain drain. And my wife said, well, if they were so worried about brain drain, why don't they stop hunting brains? Which is literally, right, what they are, what they are doing. They're literally going after imprisoning and killing some of these very people. That's not a good way to get people to want to stay in your country. And so uh, I think there's a desire that maybe some of these people could come back, uh, but most of them don't want to. And so, you know, the, the, the Taliban are not the most highly educated of individuals. They're not trained as conservationists. They haven't benefited from 20 years of investment. But we still should want to somehow protect these places because they're part of the, the, the wealth of humanity. Uh, on our planet, and there are extraordinary places that are deserving of protection. Part of the hope is those communities that we invested in, that we worked with, the people who live in these regions will continue to do so, and we can return at some point to Afghanistan. And one of the things I think is so important is places like South Sudan, where you have one of the biggest migrations in the world, not of the wildebeest, but this species called the white-eared cob of, uh, you know, of Myanmar, which is going through its own political troubles, which has spectacular wildlife in the north of the country. Central African Republic, which is you know, a very dangerous place to be, also important place for species. These are places we don't just give up on, but we, we've got to find a way forward. And this is what I mean, like our obligation is, um, you know, as to paraphrase John F. Kennedy, we don't do things because they're easy, we do things because they're hard. And we run toward the hardest problems and these places uh, to be able to do so. There's a lot of times I wanted to give up on Afghanistan. I couldn't because those people risked their lives to work with me. And those people are extraordinary. They're some of the most generous kind, just lovely people. If you read the book, you know, it is a love story to Afghanistan in, in my book for the people who are there. It is far from a perfect place, but it was a pretty incredible place. Uh, so I didn't feel that I could give up and most of my colleagues that have worked with me have been working tirelessly to also try to help those individuals. And the same is replicated for every group of people who have people over there for them to help. But it's this larger question, what is our role in the world? What is the role? We cannot look, we cannot just look inside, right? This is not who we are as Americans. We're people who've always led, we've always done the right things. It is not going to be China that will protect the people in Afghanistan. They are not protecting the Uyghurs. It is not going to be Russia that will protect anyone right now. If it wasn't for the United States, Europe probably wouldn't be as united as it is just given the work that we did to pull NATO together in response to what's happening in Ukraine. And I think the same thing is we can't shriek from the challenges in the rest of the world. We have problems at home, but we are too interconnected uh, not to do so. Sorry, I'm on the podium, so I'm going off, but I apologize. <laughs> Last
Last question. Yes. I don't know if the Taliban will, but I do see the possibility of working with many people around the world. The challenge is for the people who I've trained to be the future of conservation, who have gotten PhDs and master's degrees in the United States, in the UK, in India, in other places where we've trained them, I can't ask them to stay because I want them to stay. So there is that dilemma. And the thought of restarting everything from scratch is a bit daunting, right? Do I think that we should still try to protect these species? Yes, right, we still need to. We can't right now because the United States won't allow, we couldn't even send money. <laughs> we were trying to send money to the Afghans uh, because there's, there's literally a famine. All the funding has been cut off to Afghanistan. The, the, the people who worked with us are now in serious trouble. We tried to send them, we're trying to send them money via Western Union, and then the Treasury Department shut down Conservation X Labs. And I am putting my organization, which is a tiny little organization at risk, you know, when the Treasury Department is shutting us down from international transfers, even via Western Union, we're not in violation of sanctions, but just, you know, there is this view. I think we have to find some sort of balance as to how we address this issue. I think Biden has made that decision, keeping essentially half the money of, that was frozen in U.S. accounts, releasing half of it back to Afghanistan. I think that's a good start. but. You know, I, I don't love the Taliban. I'm not interested in, uh, interested in the Taliban, but like I am interested in helping the people of Afghanistan. I am interested in helping uh, the wildlife of Afghanistan. And there, there's gonna be, a, you know, we need to think about it. The, the other piece is we've also forgotten about much of the Middle East actually has, is rich in biodiversity. So there's a lot that we can do in these places. And there's a lot of ways that science and environment can actually be a basis for diplomacy uh, on, to, for which the official relationship can stand. And I used to work at the State Department on Arab-Israeli cooperation over water. Uh, and even during the periods of conflict, the scientists would work together. So I think there's ways that we can connect to people, but we have suffered a lot of brain drain in the Taliban, and the question is, they're still people, you know? So it's, it, it, it won't be easy for us to be able to do so, but there's a lot worth protecting in this place. Last question. Yeah, so it's very funny. When we started Conservation X Labs, the original name was C2SI, which is a totally wonky DC name, and it's terrible. And it stood for Climate and Conservation Security International, something Jeff DeBacco would really appreciate. And the intent was recognizing that na our national security was linked to the environment. And we definitely see that. We know that the pandemic is due to our misuse of nature, and we keep doubling down on that kind of thing. Uh, so. Um, so, you know, we've been always interested in going back to some of these hard places, particularly because we've got the logistics and understanding of how to do that work. Uh, but, you know, Conservation X Labs is more of an innovation and technology company than it is place-based conservation. The one place that we're trying something new right now is in the Amazon basin, where we're working on an issue called artisanal scale mining. And there we're trying to essentially build an, an innovation community to create new pathways for sustainability uh, for those individuals. Until you give people alternatives, you will, you will not stop them 
from, from, you know, they need to eat, they need to live lives. And we have this challenge that you might have heard me say today, that we ask those people who are closest to the problem to bear the greatest burden of conservation, even though much of the demand comes from us in the West, even though the United States and Europe and others have devastated our environment and the environments of others in building our economies, we have to deal with that issue. We have to recognize that imbalance that is there uh, around what we're trying to do. Um, on that, thank you very much. Thank you for coming. I much appreciate everyone coming in person.